around because now we have a mixture of people here. Some of you have been there all the two days already in the conference, others are newcomers. We had here a conference, a science conference, also with some policy makers and practical forestry people and nature conservation people in the last two days. And the big topic was governing and managing forests for multiple ecosystem, forest ecosystem services across the globe. We had discussions, for instance, relating to questions such as how are trade-offs and synergies between different forest ecosystem services perceived, governed, and managed in forests. We asked about what concepts do exist for integrated forest management, and also what drives these concepts, so what's happening at the policy level, what's happening, what drives this in terms of environmental change, what are issues of biodiversity loss, what are issues of climate change adaptation and mitigation, how are they important, we had lively discussions also this afternoon in the forests where we learned different perspectives on integrated forest management. And now the purpose of this evening event is to, be, to get a bit more political, so to say. Um, so you are now our policy stakeholders and policy experts here in the panel. And we would like to discuss with you, but also with the entire auditory that is composed of scientists, but also policy experts, but also bond citizens with an interest in the topic. So what visions are there from, from policymakers' perspective for sustainable management for multiple ecosystem services in forestry? So what are your visions? But also we would like to discuss with you um, in relation to the recent debate on the European Green Deal, where some of you are quite busy with, uh, I know. Um, how, what can a European forest policy do to support your vision? What do you demand also from European policy? And to discuss these questions, I'm really, really happy and honored to introduce the panelists. I start with the lady in the center, Eva Müller. Is, uh, I learned this now, General, Director General, and not head, Director General of the Department of Forest and Sustainability and Sustainable Raw Material in the German Ministry for um, Food and Agriculture, BML. Then Luc, next to me, Luc Bass is director of IUCN in Europe. And don't tell me you're director general. Then. <laughs> and then Bernhard Budil, I have don't ever, I follow the order on my sheet and not the order here in the, in the row, is general secretary of the agricultural and forest enterprises in Austria. And also he has been quite active in European forest policy already. Then there's Umberto Delgado Rosa. He's director of DG Environment in the European Commission and has been engaged in many forest issues also in his career. And finally, Mats Jensen, um, head of office from the Nature Agency um, in Denmark, and currently representing the chair of the network Integrate, which I introduced to others. It's a network that the European Forest Institute is facilitating that deals with question of the integration of nature conservation issues in forest management. Then we have two distinguished scientists that are talking to with each other over there. Bo Larsen from the University of Copenhagen, Gertje de Boers. And now they stop talking, it's a bit like in teaching, eh? So, <laughs> and, they will, and they're here because they want to give us some insights in a very quick format on two big challenges for forest management. One is biodiversity and biodiversity integration. The gentleman on the right and the gentleman on the left from my perspective, he will talk about climate change climate change adaptation as a big challenge, a big, big challenge for forestry we talked also about in the forest today. I would also like to mention that this event is also um, an exciting um, event for the city of Bonn and the European Forest Institute in Bonn because it's the starting event of a series of talks and events we are trying to organize with many, many partners here in the room, not only the city, not only EFI, but mostly other partners, the so-called Bonner Waldgespräche, Bonn Talks, where we want to address very different people ranging from, from citizens with an interest in forest policy and forest issues up to um, employers and of, of governmental, non-governmental organizations in Bonn. There are many more to follow, and if you want to uh, receive more information on that, there are many leaflets of that out of the room. And before we finally talk, and I already invite our distinguished speakers, starting with Gertjan, to slowly come to, to there. I would also like to say um, who funds this all, because we have about 13 international research organizations that are participating in the conference and have committed themselves to this conference we have been doing. And the main funders for, for this event here, including the panel discussion, 
however, none of you requested a fee, I should also say, <laughs> um, is the German BML through the Informer project, is the German Research Foundation to the Confobi project, and Swedish Formers to the Polyforest project. This is an European research project. With that, um, I can still speak for another minute to explain. Oh, 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 he's already ready. So, um, what are we doing now tonight? Um, we will have short introductions by our two scientists, and then we will have a, a round of um, opening statements by the panelists. They will give us their vision, their expectations towards the topic of the conference, towards the two questions I've just been raising. Then we will have a short discussion here in the panel. And then very soon we try to open up and we will give the word to you to comment, to ask questions and to engage in this discussion. And I'm sure we will have no problem of filling the time until we intend to end about 9.15, 9.20. You ready? Yeah, I think Great. So, yep. Gert Jan, Good. seven minutes on one of the biggest Oof. challenges for forests in All Europe right. and globally. That's a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Georg. Thank you all for coming back here after a very nice excursion and, uh, and a lovely dinner and still being here in the evening. Indeed, I'm going to talk about a big challenge that we are facing. And I start with a, a study we did. Uh, and, and the idea is maybe already from, well, the publication is from 2013, but the idea is from 2008, 2009. And one part of this, this economic value loss under climate change was the change of tree species in Europe. And one part was a climate envelope model that fits a species where it fits in the, in the climate. And if you look at, this is the current distribution of spruce, current year, and look at the timer, and you see how it under a climate change scenario shifts northwards in 2070, 2100, to just the north of Finland and Sweden and a little bit left in the Alps. I thought, we, we thought, well, okay, it's nice. Modeling study, well, who cares? It's far away, who cares? But, oops, the actuality is, is that this is already happening. You saw it this afternoon in the forest and how the forest management adapts to this, how fast these changes really go. This is, of course, where well, you recognize it all, mortality of spruce in the hearts. And countries are realizing this, how fast this is going and how, what they need to do to adapt. Also, if they need natural resources and preserve biodiversity, they need to adapt. This is an enormous challenge we are facing. So the impacts are increasing, but they're not increasing just like one flow over the whole European continent. It's very diverse, species-specific, location-specific, very difficult to track it. In addition, we have a climate mitigation task. We have to sequester carbon, we have to sequester it in the ecosystem, in the soils and in the wood products. We have, in addition, a renewable energy target. We have to achieve bioenergy demand. Enormous challenges facing us. The bioeconomy, we do not always only want to use wood for energy, but also for products and maybe hundreds of new type of uh, products, textile, etc. <coughs> But already now, you see the tension building up. There are lots of conflicts over forest management, conflicts over use of wood for bioenergy. Where to do all of these, uh, fulfill all these demands? And not only these demands, these new ones, but still we have to fulfill the traditional ones as well. Biodiversity, the numbers of species are going down. This is an enormous threat for all of us. Recreation, etc., etc. We need to fulfill that. What we introduced in 2015 at the COP25 was this, the idea of climate smart forestry. We, we named it. And that aims well, both at increasing forest productivity, maintaining forest productivity, but certainly also adapting and building resilience into, uh, of the ecosystem to climate change, and of course reducing and removing greenhouse gases. But one of the aspects of climate smart forest is that you do very different things. The discussion is very often, oh, we have to manage forests in order to fulfill the most optimal carbon mitigation. And others say, no, we have to store as much carbon as possible in the ecosystem. But we say, we, you really have to look at the local circumstances. What is the best measure to do? And it can really vary. It can vary from setting aside forest 
to improving your management, adapting species, choosing new provenances, choosing new species. That is what climate smart forestry is, fulfilling all these goals. And one of the other studies we try to emphasize, we try to strategize that across Europe. Where is it, well, op, it's not an optimization, but where could you do best what? You can strategize for forest management from strict reserves at some locations, and maybe at the steep slopes, uh, maybe at locations that are not so productive, up to even areas where you have very intensive forestry, where the growth conditions are very good, like here or there, Maybe that's where you produce your wood. And in other regions of Europe, you, you concentrate more on biodiversity. It is a bit of a land sparing approach, but, but really looking at the circumstances, really looking at the local, local situation. That's what we, we propose then. And it is possible then with our, we, we do uh, very uh, detailed NFI plot based modeling with our groups in Wageningen and together with the European Forest Insti in Institute. We have that very detailed information. A lot of countries carry out a national forest inventory, but a lot of that information is hardly used. Well, we are using that. You can look at the local situation, what is best to do where. Uh, here you see, for example, the 3D view on the Vosque Mountains in, in northern France, where you see the stocks of spruce. Here you see the stocks of oak and beech. Diversifying your management, trying to strategize that, trying to locate and, and link your resources also to the industry. That is what you can do with this, using the information in an optimal way. <coughs> uh, my carnival voice is already giving up now, <laughs> but we'll get there. It's just the two more slides. So this is, for example, Climate Smart Forestry in the Netherlands. We have a Dutch climate accord aiming at minus 50% uh, emission uh, reduction uh, in 2030, only 10 years from now. A part of that is also forestry pilots, and we are under planting like what you saw this afternoon in the forest with a variety of species in these stands that are not productive anymore. They suffer under the drought. Uh, the biodiversity values are not very high. So we're under planting with a variety of species and provenances to try to maintain the system, improve the soils, et cetera, et cetera. This is happening in the Netherlands already. And if the Netherlands can do it, then every forestry country can do it. <laughs> so we will set up this year a network of climate smart forestry in Europe. I know a lot of countries are dealing with these issues. You saw it outside. So we will set up a, a, a climate smart forestry network this year where, which will have a, uh, where I think that climate smart forestry under the Green Deal needs both research for this, what is best to do where, which provenances to choose, which three species. <coughs> the member states need to collaborate in that network. They are building up experience with uh, dealing with climate, climate smart forestry. Sweden and Finland, for example, Norway, but certainly also in the south, Spain is dealing with it, Bulgaria and Romania, etc., etc. So, and then, as certainly last but not least, the Commission should take a strong pull in this as well. Uh, hopefully, in a, in a collaborative way, where the different DGs pull this together, uh, trying to step maybe over some uh, some uh, some constraints. Klima, energy, agri and environment, I think, can pull this off together and, and get that land use part of the Green Deal uh, going. And that's where my intervention stops. Thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So that was uh, Gertjan Boers from Wageningen University, and I should also say he is well qualified for that because he's the coordinating lead author of the agriculture and forest forestry section of the IPCC. Report, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is also well qualified, uh, Bo Lassen from University of Copenhagen. Um, someone who has been advocating and researching and dealing with silvicultural questions, integration of biodiversity, integrated forest management since a time when I was probably in kindergarten. And so we look very much yeah. forward to you yeah. uh, earlier. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah. Nice that you think I'm so young. <laughs> Great. Bo, look uh, forward to your insights. I should use the mic here, or could I just speak like that? Better uh, mic. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. 
better the microphone. The microphone. Well, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Is it okay? Thank you for uh, inviting me here. Uh, I'm asked to talk about the biodiversity challenge, and uh, I'm going to do that. But you can see the uh, underheading is among other challenges, because you cannot deal with biodiversity uh, alone just now, because then you are making the same failure as we have done for the last 200 years. We have been focusing upon a specific thing, and 20, 30 years later, something new comes up. So, and it has a lot to do with integration or separation of functions or land sharing, land sparing. Um, let me see, so, okay. We have been seeing the other days, we have been listening to what happened in the, the US, in Canada, in uh, Australia, uh, and in Russia. Uh, but I must say that Europe is something unique. And it is important to realize that in Europe, we have managed our land and our forest for several thousand years. We have a long tradition, we have a long le legacy in uh, working with that. And what is basically now the case? We can say that all our forests in Europe are cultural influenced. We cannot find any place which are not influenced by man. And very few are left in what you can say a semi-natural stage. And here you can see uh, the percentage of uneven aged forest as a total of the high forest, uh, of the, the forest available for wood uh, uh, supply. And if you look and uh, look, uh, not take Cyprus and Slovenia and Yugoslavia and, couple, and Portugal in here, we can see most of the countries in Europe have between zero and 10% of their forest in a semi-natural stage. For instance, just talking about species uh, uh, mixtures and uh, different ages. That's one thing. Here, and very, very few forests in Europe are left unmanaged. And here you can see the percentage of the forests which are st under strict protection. And again, uh, there are some, for, uh, some areas here, Liechtenstein and Slovakia, which have 50 to 20% of their forest basically unmanaged. Most of the countries in Europe have less than two, three, four, up till 5%. So, Houston, we have a problem. We really have. Europe has a problem in terms of preserving nature. Because also outside forest in Europe, we have less nature. Okay, but then the next step is dealing with forest. It's a long-term business, and we are dealing with uncertainty, and that is really important. And one thing we uh, we are oh, sorry, that's really bad here. Uh, one thing we are, we have learned is is uh, we're dealing with different challenges: pollution, novel pest, climate change, as you just talked about here, but also social conflicts. Think about the Bal Balkans in the 90s or in, by, in economic unrest and so on. We are dealing with that. We often forget that we also have to accomplish the uncertainty in relation to changing goals. We have been working with wood production as a main goal since 1750. Then, after the Second World War, recreation came up. 1990, biodiversity. Huh? I still remember the head of the Danish forest uh, state uh, here. He came back from, uh, from uh, uh, Rio and said to me, Bo, now I eventually have learned what is biodiversity. And I said to him, yes, what's that? Yes, it is biological diversity where you have removed the logical. <laughs> that was the answer. Of, uh, of, 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 of the man responsible for the public forest in Denmark 30 years ago. Today, they are, the only thing you are, you are haunting now, it's running after, is biodiversity. Okay, and then here, come on, 2010, carbon capture. That's a new thing. We are 
really ignorant if we believe that we now know the whole asset of challenges in terms of goals we have. New things will come up. 2030, what's the next? That means that we are dealing with a kind of double uncertainty. Uncertainty in terms of environment and, and challenges here, uh, and the uncertainty in terms of what are people, what are the goals in the future. And that is, the question is for us is to safeguard adaptive capacity. We have talked about that. Yeah? Resilience and all these things, but also functional flexibility. And we often forget that. And if we now are focusing entirely upon biodiversity and uh, I will talk about climate change because that's more complex, then we might not reach the needs for the future. Okay. So, for sure, we have to set aside forest for nature only. We need that. And we need also to have highly productive forest for industry and so on. But the question is, if we only are focusing upon natural forests and focus upon lignicultures or forest plantations, then we are lo losing functional flexibility. A forest set aside just for nature, you cannot just change it to something else because then it, new, it, it loses its functions. Or how can you build in very, in a very short term, other functions in a forest basically aimed at producing timber. So therefore, this thing in between, what we can call the integrated multifunctional forest, it comes in as the third option. And that is the difference between land sharing here and land sparing there. And talking about the integrated multifunctional forest, then we have developed all over the world a lot of, of, of uh, ideas and also uh, methods to deal with that. Close to nature forestry, continuous forest cover, retention forestry, reduced impact logging, mimicking natural disturbances, and so on and so forth. Then the question comes up about adaptability not only in terms of functional uh, use and so on, but also in terms of climate change and so on, then we could argue, is this kind of forest, is that really the way to create resilient forests? What about the resilience in these kind of systems here? And it is important to take into consideration And then the question is, of course, in relation to the actual situation, the country, the history, and so on and so forth, then you can find a proper level where you will say land sharing and land sparing. And that is important. And now I come to the second last uh, uh, here and come back to my work earlier times uh, in uh, C4, we developed this uh, notion of adaptive co-management. This is extremely important because we have to deal with changing goals. We have to deal with new challenges. And that can only be done in some kind of a uh, adaptive management methods where we all the time are looking at what is, ha what is ha happening here, what are happening here, always changing our attitude revising things, coming up with new uh, decisions. And then the last uh, thing here is quo vadis foresti. That means where to go, forester. Okay? Come on. I believe that it has to be nature and society adapted. That means closer to nature. Study nature and make use of its ability to renew and prevail under changing settings. That's what you've been talking about. 
support and protect natural processes. It is land sparing, setting aside, but then also, and that's not less important, not only closer to nature, but closer to people. Locally adapted ownership side society, keep the dialogue with society, create ownership and around means and methods in planning and management. And that's my, after 40 years working in this business here, this is my testament. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Bo. I hope it's uh, not the last time we heard your testament here and that we will hear it for many more years. Thank you. Now it's time to really give a voice to the <laughs> panelists. Uh, the two questions we, we ask you to prepare a bit for us to repeat is, first of all, what visions do you have for sustainable forest management for multiple ecosystem services in the future? Um, and secondly, what should European forest policy do to support this vision? Focusing a bit on the, on the Green Deal discussion, but not only. You can have a broader perspective. And I would suggest we just start with the gentleman to my left, with Luc, and three minutes. And we very much look forward to hearing your responses to these two questions. Thanks, Georg. Um, and let me start by saying that uh, I was really sorry I couldn't be on your field trip. Because talking about forests without having been in the field is, is, makes no sense. But I can tell you that... From my Brussels office, I once in a while do the effort to go and see the very beautiful forests we still have, especially in the eastern part of Europe. Um, I was lucky to be in Bielavesia, in the Romanian Carpathian Forest, to see the beauty, but also the challenges. Um, and we, we know there are challenges. I don't have a slide, but I think both slides would summarize quite well where IOCN stands on these uh, issues, because it is about be working closer with nature. It is also, of course, mm -hmm. about protecting the little nature that we have left. And it is working with the people. It's really working with the people. On those visits that I went to the forest, I was as much emphasizing on the being in the field as talking to the local uh, community and to see what their needs are. And sometimes they are a little bit different than what they are being uh, pronounced in, in, in media and in press. Um, and and that, that is actually the only way to, to get to know what's really going on. Um, I want to start by just reminding a few things uh, about what is actually the basis of our well-being. And if you look at the SDGs, and I got my pin and I wear it in every conference, it is all about this development in a context of your planetary boundaries. And the bottom line is your nature context. It is the same for forest sector. It's for every sector. If you don't get your bottom line right, and there is this famous graph. That's the slide I would have shown, but it's, it's the one where you have the natural world as the basis for your economic and your social development, obviously. Um, and if we fully realize that, then we are to see, okay, what is left in Europe at, as very precious and, and, and the primary old growth, whatever the name is, and I think we should take a precautionary approach here because there's always a discussion, is it old growth, is it primary forest? And as a non-forester and with all the experts in the room here, I wouldn't even dare to go there. But it's better to take a precautionary approach because there's so little left that is natural. And so we should take a, a very good, good uh, view on that. The second thing that I wanted to mention is the, there's so much data and Geert Jan's data are incredible and I'm sure in the last two days and again tomorrow there's, a, there's an enormous amount of knowledge. <coughs> uh, so ultimately we, we should be knowing what we should be doing. That shouldn't be the issue, okay? We, we always need to know more but we do know more than enough to know what we have to do. The problem is that there is still contradicting, um, is it data or is it, um, is it communication? And um, I, I was moderating a panel in the Charlemagne building uh, two or three weeks ago, and, and uh, the president of Justafor, and afterwards we talked about it at length, he was saying, biodiversity is increasing in the European forests. A very bold statement. And then you look at the reports, and I will start with IOCN's red list. <coughs> we did a red list of the, of the European trees. I hope you've seen it. And 43% of the native trees are actually uh, endangered with extinction. In different levels, if you continue business as usual, ultimately, yes, 43% of the species, tree species in Europe will disappear. Of course, there's different levels of, of threat, but that would be the ultimate uh, unfortunate result. And we don't even talk about the climate change threat. Eh? This is under the context of what we know today. Um, and then, but here I speak for Umberto, I think, but we all know that uh, from the 
uh, from the, the conservation status of the forest is not good, 26% uh, um, is, is threatened, 15% of the habitats, and then of course you have your unfavorable conservation status in 25%. Only in 25% you have a favorable conservation status. So there is a problem, you cannot deny it. Now there is many demands, there's a lot of consumption, the demands will grow, as you've seen here in, the, in all the slides, so the challenge will only be becoming bigger. And if you look at it from a sector perspective, and I think many of you are close to making the case for the forester and making also an income and making sure that the business is running, um, the business is still dominantly running on timber. And I'm saying something that is an opening, uh, pushing in an open door, but if we don't change that equation, we will really not get into the real multifunctionality or in, into really making the case uh, for more and, and more strict protection, which is another issue. There is a lot of protected forests, but in different levels of protection, as you know. So I'll try to, I, I'm, you're looking at me too close, so I'll try to close with the natural capital, it's not accounted for. The foresters that deliver their ecosystem services, they do not get properly rewarded. Their the subsidies are steering you in the wrong direction, the same as in the agricultural context. But then ultimately what puzzles me most, and this is here I will end, is an initiative, and I have to mention it because it's called the Bond Challenge. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the, that the colleague from, from, the, from the government in, in, in Germany is well aware. There is a Bond Challenge, a global Bond Challenge, launched in 2010 about uh, to restore forest in a landscape context, because that's really important. It's not just reforestation, it's a forest landscape restoration effort. In a landscape context, which means serving the people, serving the local communities, as, as it does uh, for increasing biodiversity. And we have global commitments planned, hoped for 350 million hectares by 2030. By now, there's 170 million hectares pledged, dominantly in the developing countries, 15 million in the United States, and my final point is, in Europe, hardly anything, but it would be not fair to say where it is. It is only the Scottish government that has pledged 170,000 hectares, I believe. And there's not a single pledge from Europe. And my, I'm puzzled. We always say, yes, there is an increment of the forest in Europe, but we know that it has to be more resilient, so we want to not only restore degraded land, but also restore re degraded forests. There is a huge opportunity. We see return on investment. We can make the case on return on investment and still we are dragging our feet. So I hope that at some point, when, once we have a clear targets on protection, we will make sure that we go faster and stronger on restoration in Europe as well. Awesome. Luc, thank you. You negotiated yourself well into five minutes. Uh, Umberto, you're probably oh, the closest only, to the clean I only have one minute then. No. Uh, well, uh, we don't bargain. Uh, I hope you stick to the tree. No, I'll try <laughs> to, to stick to it. Let me try to, to, to be quick. Uh, first, uh, multifunctionality of forests is not a, uh, a new concept within e EU policy because you already find it first in the current for a strategy and certainly in the Green Deal. So mm -hmm. that's well established. And it's good to, to understand why, because I mean, for long we have looked to forests as timber providers. So that was not really multifunctional. We just taken as granted that the rest was still there and often it was not. So I can indeed testify that EU forests eco as ecosystems are not in good shape in many places. Uh, so what uh, Luke said, that, uh, that saves me uh, some says about that. But again, just remind you the droughts that affect forests in Germany, the bark beetle in, uh, in Central Europe, the forest fires, yes, in Southern Europe, like my country, but also in boreal forests, that is, uh, has been knock, knocking at our door. While at the same time, <laughs> there's ample buzzword of sustainable forest management everywhere. I can, I can tell you of some places where we have rather unsustainable forest management. In other places, they're excellent management, of course. So one issue to keep in mind is, in theory, forests provide all the multifunctionality of services, but we also need these services to be provided in practice. And in practical terms, sometimes they are not there. Another element is, I think it was, I've heard Vice President Timmermans from the Commission say recently that bio does not mean sustainable per se. It depends. So some people kind of pick, well, biomass that's renewable, isn't it? So voila, no problem at all. It will come back again. Yes, it will come back again, but I can tell you, oil will come back again if you give it millions of years enough for that, or coal. So it depends, The let's say, this renewability of woody biomass 
is not measurable in the same way as wind that comes every day or sun that comes every day, and we must take this into account. So just building on the bio or renewable world as a, so let me do whatever I want, it doesn't work also. Uh, so this is to say that, of course, we'll need, um, need, we'll need more biomass, which means we must manage it very carefully because why do we want to use biomass? We want to use it if it helps for these things here, the sustainable development goals is not a goal in itself. So if in the end, if the balance both of carbon of the other and the other SDGs that underpin the society and the economy don't function, we don't really have uh, something sustainable. Um, now, Luke also said, yes, integrated forest management. What it must mean that is that we must manage forests, of course, for timber provision, but to provide much more than that. And where is the difficulty? We all know that uh, the value of a forest, if you count all the services that it provides from water to recreation to air renovation, you tell me, goes beyond timber the value of timber. But timber is the easy one. It's the one that the forest owner or the forester can grasp. The other society is not really paying. So we have here one difficulty on how can we noticeably use public money to also deliver for these other services that uh, are uh, less captured. Are there trade-offs? Yes, there are tra uh, trade-offs. One of which is carbon sink versus bioenergy. Uh, some people seem to say, oh, again, this is all bio, it will get back again. I'm sorry, yes. But when you cut a tree to burn, you put immediately the CO2 in the atmosphere. You will get it back, but it takes from 20 to 200 years, putting it simply. To, can we wait 20 years to solve the climate uh, equation? I don't think it can. So uh, it doesn't mean that we won't use biomass for bioenergy, but we can't just treat that as, uh, and who cares about the sink? As you're looking at me, let me just say two final uh, words then, which is, in general, <coughs> Closer to nature forestry helps for multifunctionality and integration. There's uh, several levels of closeness to nature. It doesn't mean you just do a fully natural forest, but you can put a bit more nature even in very uh, productive forests. So that usually helps. And my final thought is I'm always puzzled when I see debates on forestry, the debate on separation versus integration. In the sense that for me, the, the um, strict protection, the setting aside, is a pure management option. In some cases, our right management option is here we don't touch, is for the ecological process to go on. Sometimes we even need to manage the invasive species, the visitors, the pressures around. But I would say, I like very much that graph approach. We can have a bit more of close to nature and very a lot of close to nature, which is the strict protection. But we certainly need more of that because we have forgotten it for centuries. Thank you, Umberto. We just continue with Eva. Yeah, Maybe thank you very much. Um, <coughs> we've heard a lot about land sparing and land sharing, and uh, those terms really stuck to my mind, I must say. Mm. And I wouldn't say we are one or the other, but we in the ministry really believe in an integrated and balanced approach where forest conservation and forest management go hand in hand. Because when you look, for example, at German forests, half of them are privately owned. And these private forest owners have generated always in the past a lot of their income from the sale of timber. But at the same time, the same forests provide a lot of other functions and services. And I just want to mention one of them, recreation. We Germans love to walk in the forest and recreation is very important to us. And in fact, German citizens have legal access to all forests in the country, including the private forests. So, um, but the private forest owners have never been receiving any recognition for this service they're providing to German society. Now, we've had some uh, very difficult two years. We had very dry summers, we had bark beetle attacks, we had storms. You probably saw some of this when you went on a field trip today. And this is not something that is an isolated event. We believe that in the future with climate change, we may have recurrent events like this, which will mean that in the future, 
our private forest owners may not be able to cover all their management costs and generate income from the sale of timber only. So it's really for us time to think about possible ways of how we could recognize these ecosystem services. And this is a discussion that is going on in, in Germany, it's gathering momentum. Let me come to the Green Deal. The Green Deal has very ambitious targets on tackling climate change and biodiversity loss, and, and that's very good, we welcome that. When we look at uh, the document and how forests are set within this context, they're really set within this context of climate change and biodiversity loss. What we are a little bit concerned about is that there seems to be <coughs> a, a, an apparent shift towards more the ecological dimensions of sustainability and potentially at the cost of the other two, the social and economic. What we would like to see is a new forest strategy, EU forest strategy that will be developed in the context of the Green Deal that really takes into account all these functions of the forests and that provides a balanced and integrated approach and that also maybe emphasizes a little bit more the forest management aspect than it currently seems to do. There's one very good example of an integrated approach to forest management in Europe and those who went on the field trip, you saw that today, uh, because it combines forest production with forest conservation and that's the European Integrate Network, which was, by the way, already set up four years ago as part of the current EU forest strategy. And there are currently 17 EU member states and Switzerland that are active in the network and they have set up demonstration sites all over Europe. And it's also growing. So it's really a nice way where jointly the member states and the European Commission promote a concrete and, and very practice-oriented approach across Europe. And I believe Mats Jensen will be <coughs> telling us more about this. So just to conclude, in the context of the Green Deal, we would like to see a strong EU forest strategy that considers, of course, the key elements of the biodiversity strategy that will be developed first, but that also highlights the social and economic dimensions of forests. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Eva Müller. Bernhard Budil from Austria, what are your expectations? Thank you, Georg. The nice and funny thing on panel discussions is that with every speaker, uh, and you have prepared some, some interventions, uh, this changes rapidly. So I <laughs> skip this and go yes. to reflect on this other <laughs> You have a learning advantage here. So. <laughs> um, um, Eva, she uh, brought already some issues I wanted to raise. Uh, so nevertheless, I want to uh, underline only two elements of this. The one is what we in Austria call the... Uh, backwash effect. The backwash effect, you know, this is what is behind the ship and where the propeller comes and moves the water and then you have like a big V, uh, these uh, waves and the sparkling water. And uh, in terms of forestry, this means the propeller uh, is the uh, usage of forest, so timber production and uh, biomass production, and the income from that. And from this income, in former times, you were able uh, to uh, solve <coughs> all the costs from ecosystem services which were demanded from society. Nowadays, we have a big difference um, already since years. So for a forest owner, uh, you are far away from having profit and you are nowadays even far away from having an income. Um, so the challenge is how to deal with, re uh, with replanting, how to deal with uh, managing, how to deal with, uh, yeah, with, with working with your forests with in the nature. But I leave this question open and come back to that later. Um, and I will rush through all these um, elements like, you know, that uh, the expectations and demands from society are increasing rapidly and we heard that already. Uh, but when it comes to Ecosystem services. I think we have to have a picture for that. And my picture is everything in forest is ecosystem services when you dig into the detail. 
And it's like a big mobile. You know what a mobile is? This is the thing hanging from the from the mm -hmm. uh, ceiling uh, with this different element. It's, it's well balanced. It's like a like a toy. And uh, when you're increasing one of these elements or you're decreasing one, this mobile starts to get imbalanced. Mm -hmm. So and this is what we are facing right now. And uh, now refracting to both uh, intervention, I was up and down. Uh, you started quite nice uh, when you said we shouldn't do uh, the same mystic we have done in the, in the past and uh, trying to have a key on only one of these elements. But I have the feeling now we start to have uh, um, yeah, a key on other elements. So we are, it, this balance is getting imbalanced again. And I have the feeling in middle Europe we are quite good balanced right now. Uh, but we can discuss this later. Um, we have to divide when it comes to ecosystem services between two different types of ecosystem services. They are the ones which are called ecosystem services and which are uh, naturally, which are uh, here um, like, um, yeah, they are, they are here uh, um, provided by nature. And then you have this ecosystem services provision which is not provided by nature, it's only provided if you manage your forest. And uh, if you, if you uh, share or try to, to get the share of this, I have the feeling the balance is that you need more management for ecosystem services than those you have only by nature. And to provide these ecosystem services, uh, you need money, you need uh, income, Otherwise, uh, nobody will be able to do it outside. So I will come to my conclusion. Um, and I, I have a slide for that. Is it possible to, to have this okay. slide up there? And um, yeah, in, in the meantime, uh, what we need? What we need is a holistic approach. Uh, and this multifunctionality or this multifunctional uh, way uh, how to manage uh, forests. And this is the circle of forestry future uh, we elaborated. Climate protection is the overall goal because climate change is something which uh, really is on the top. Um, for climate protection, we need an active and sustainable forest management. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of this active forest management is not all elements, but one of this part is timber usage and bioeconomy. Because with this bioeconomy, uh, we are able to solve these problems with uh, climate change. And uh, Umberto uh, raised the point that uh, CO2 is uh, uh, not, uh, if, you, if you burn biomass, uh, then you ex uh, right now have the, the, um, the CO2 emission. But if you store it in furniture and, and all the other elements, then you ha haven't this uh, uh, right now, um, what is it? Um, releasing, to the atmosphere. releasing to the atmosphere. Okay, okay. so in the, the, in the last point, if you, if you change this circle, uh, then it's, 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 the, it's the bad circle way, because if, if we, uh, we, we haven't heard right now what, what is the, the solution uh, to uh, change the climate. There are different parts, but what we always hear is that uh, the use or the substitution of fossil-based products and materials is the main aspect. Mm -hmm. And one of the key elements is to use uh, biomass, and this is done with bioeconomy. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Lennart. Mats, on the very end, chair of the Integrate Network, what is your statement? And how many minutes do I have? Minus minutes or? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Danish approach. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, please, for the next minutes, bear in mind that I come out of a public forestry, and it might be different point of views from private forestries. Uh, first of all, being end of line and end of two days of discussions, it's obvious that the challenges is and demands for the forests are increasing a lot these years. Mm -hmm. You talked about it both, for instance, that the, the, the demands are changing over the years, 
I would even say it's changing more rapidly over the years nowadays than it did 40 years ago, at least in Denmark. I guess some of my former colleagues 40 years ago, they must have had an easier life than I feel I have, <laughs> at least. Uh, they were supposed mainly to, do, to, to, to produce timber. Nowadays in Denmark, at least, for a public forester, as I represent, we are asked to deliver a lot of different things. Not only these three things, like biodiversity, timber, and a, and a mixture. There's a lot of range of things that we are asked to deliver, whether it's clean water or recreational aspects or uh, historical uh, sites that we have to, uh, to, to, uh, to ensure, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we need to be flexible uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming years. This leads for me to, uh, to the fact that it is more complicated to be a public forester, at least, than it used to be. And complicated questions need to be dealt with in, the, in collaboration with others. This is very important for me. Uh, for, as far as I can see it from a Danish point of view, we need to collaborate a lot with these different kind of groups that demands different kind of, uh, of uh, results from the forest. And I would say that that counts also for a global point of view. We need to be able to work together quite, quite good. That means that we have to change from a, a sector-wise focus on, on the forest's issues to a more uh, a, a, a broader uh, point of view. And this leads, uh, for me, to the fact that it's not, a it's not a question about integration or segregation. It's a matter of both ways. Mm. Therefore, we in Denmark work, uh, as we say, on we are we're trying to integrate the segregation as well. It's part of the integration that some of this must be segregated. Um, mm -hmm. To do that, to have a mixture, and to have this uh, middle um, with uh, integration, you need to build up trust to the people that we, you work together with. This is very important for me. Uh, if you don't have the trust from the people who want something else than you want to, to, to deliver, uh, you will never be able to to find a good solution within the uh, integration aspects. Mm. You will tend to, to push people to the border to say, we need to get segregation, otherwise I'm not sure I'm, I'm fulfilling my demands. Mm. You really need to build up trust to be in the middle, at least of some percentages of the forest, um, to, uh, to do this the right way. This is exactly what we are working together with uh, good colleagues uh, within this uh, voluntary European network, Integrate, uh, which I'll have the great pleasure of uh, representing as a chair the last year. Uh, we are working here together to, to join forces on bringing together the, the, the managers, the scientists, the different kinds of interests to learn about what do people want, what are the scientists saying about what could be done and how do we do it in a, in a trustful way. Um, we have another meeting coming up in Denmark and there we are actually ex exactly working about how to integrate segregation of, uh, of, uh, of nature conservation. <laughs> Oh, you're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Umberto, I would like to come back to you first, because I imagine you are one of these guys in Brussels now energetically writing on the Green Deal documents and developing a bit the vision for environmental policy or a bigger, much broader environmental policy perspective. Now, you heard all the different statements that quite nicely, in my view, from this gentleman to these gentlemen, to showed a bit the diversity of visions and ideas, but also potentials to integrate that. So what is sort of, first of all, is there a shift? Do you see a policy change now connected to the Green Deal? 
And what concretely does it mean for this question of forest management? Can you be a bit more specific? What do you think would you do? If you would do it alone, how would you do it? <laughs> well, I won't do it alone, so... <laughs> so. It's better that I tell you how we'll do it as commission. But first, let me start with a more general comment on something Eva said, that she feared the Green Deal was putting too much focus not on the environmental pillar of sustainable development. Well, well, first I would say we humans manage our development for long, and I would say I would claim that for probably some myelinia without giving priority to the environment. So when we look what happened to our development, we can summarize, well, we've uh, ama got amazing developments, yes, for our health, for our economy, and so forth. But yeah, that came with a cost, which was the degradation of the atmosphere, the degradation of land, and the degradation of the ocean, or if you want, the degradation of the biosphere. And now the new conclusion we have that we strictly depend on the biosphere. You know, we don't have machines to produce water for us, or food, or air. Without nature, call it as you want, we can live. So uh, when Luke said, uh, this new model of sustainability, you know, there, there are no longer three pillars of sustainable development. There are three layers <coughs> of uh, sustainable development. They are still the same, but there's a hierarchy among them because only upon a biosphere you can build a society and only upon a society you can build an economy. Try to reverse this, it doesn't work. So what the Green Deal is doing, first, it's not the environmental agenda of the Commission. It's the full agenda of the Commission. I said it's the growth economy, it's the growth agenda, the innovation agenda, the economic agenda, and the environmental agenda, precisely with a sense of sustainability. So what is, does this mean then for forests? The fears that you've expressed ever, well, to be honest, I think much of this balance or need of balance on between ecosystem service, it, it comes from the eye of the, eye of the beholder. Ecosystem services is a cultural construct of what we want to get as a balance. Mm -hmm. And when I read the forest part of the Green Deal, I find it totally balanced. There's only one big novelty, which is the forest strategy to come will be done building on the biodiversity strategy. That used to be like that. And I've actually seen many, many reactions, even before the Green Deal came, with the main objective. Uh, putting forests and forestry aside from any interference for, from environmental policy, biodiversity policy, which just means there's a mistrust. We often, see many in the forest domain, look to the environment or the environmental actors, uh, those that want to come and restrain and uh, not allow us to do what we used to do. That's the contrary of integration and, uh, and having a balanced uh, approach. So I think, well, what will come from the Green Deal? A biodiversity strategy uh, by the end of March. We are working heavily on that. Building on it, the forest strategy will be developed by late 2020. We also aim to use better the economic and financial incentives available for forests, noticeably those in the common agriculture policy that are often at member state level kind of forgotten. Le parent pauvre, that's there, but it's not really much used. We want that to be more used. We, want, we will join forces with the member states for forest fire prevention, which is a big issue. We've seen, I've seen forest fires in, in Europe like the Australian ones, they are beyond uh, eradication when certain conditions are there, and we need to have the landscape ready for that. And we want, this is the, my final word, we want to enhance knowledge. And we have just launched in this forest conference, you were there also, look, uh, we have launched this forest information system for Europe, where that we will feed with more layers, including coming from satellites, so that at least we all know where is, and we don't debate any longer, yeah, they're in good condition, bad condition, here or there, biodiversity is declining, not declining. There's an often some lack of uh, information, but at least facts should be the same for all. Thank you, Umberto. Um, if uh, perhaps coming to you, in the last two years, forest issues have been very high here on the policy agenda in Germany. And I heard a lot about this balancing from, from different sides, and of course different people have different ideas for the balancing might mean, and, and if you put it very frankly, personal observation, you have one fraction that now says, well, we have this big issue of climate change, now we need to, to go in, in a different direction. Uh, let's call it the Douglas fir fraction, so, so forest owners that are really concerned, they have a big, they have 
big troubles and problems now with this profitability of forest management. And then you have this other, let's call it the Peter Wohleben, to be a bit extreme, Peter Wohleben fraction, saying, well, now you need to em embrace nature and you need, to, do, you need to, to work with biodiversity and you need to go in, in that way. And then there was this German Waldgipfel some time ago. And there's sort of a bit of a... Um, so everyone is a bit shattered by the events here in, in Central Europe of the last two years. Big crises, unexpectedly quick climate change impacts. So is there also an opportunity, perhaps, now that everyone is a bit like in a, oh my God, a situation, to bring these two camps or people together? And is there perhaps a chance that was mentioned partly for something like payment for environmental services? Do you see something in the German context? And has this opportunity been used up to now in your view? And how would it connect to Green Deal negotiations? It was also mentioned a bit by, by Bas. So how do you see this? Yeah, exactly. Choose the one you want to answer. <laughs> so. Well, um, I think the, the shift to more um, mixed forests in Germany had already been going on. I mean, it's been going on for 30 years. What happened is that we had these two really dry summers and we had the bark beetle attacks and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, we lose within two years 245,000 hectares of forests out of the 11 million we have. That, of course, has shaken everybody and has shaken, of course, all those private forest owners. Some of them have lost all their forests. Mm -hmm. And I think that has put a lot in motion and uh, everybody has come up with ideas, and of course this is where you get these different, um, sometimes quite polarized viewpoints of uh, leave your forests alone, let them grow old, <coughs> um, store a lot of carbon and biodiversity, and don't harvest or harvest a lot less. And then on the other side, you have those who say, well, we should still manage our forests, but they have to be more climate resilient and they have to be adapted to climate change and they have to be more mixed and more broadleaf species and so on. So, um, yes, there, were, there is definitely momentum now. Mm. And um, the Waldgipfel was organized by us. It was a, a so-called forest summit organized by the ministry where we brought all the actors together after we had managed to get from our finance minister a huge amount of money to help the forest owners. Mm. We have now, for the next four years, about 800 million euro to help restore, reforest these areas that have been lost. And also to help accelerate adaptation of the remaining forests to climate change. So that's a big amount of money. And we sat down with all the actors, with all the stakeholders, to figure out what needs to be done and how to best use this money. And there were a lot of recommendations coming out of this which then became the, the basis for guidelines we developed or a set of rules we developed for how we go, we're going to be using this money to really make sure that you know, whatever is restored now, replanted or regenerated naturally is more adapted to climate change. And that really, in the current situation, nobody really knows you know, in which direction this is going to be going. We know that we're probably not going to be having much spruce in the future. Mm -hmm. That is almost certain, I think, it, most people agree on that. And uh, in most situations, you would be crazy to start planting spruce again. Mm -hmm. But which species are we planting? That's far from being sure. So at the moment, the strategy we're having is to, uh, to minimize risk and really plant or, or, or regenerate la larger numbers of species so that you can make sure that at least some of them may survive. Mm. Mm. And then, as I said earlier in my statement, um, the forest owners now have heard about the new climate program in Germany and that there's going to be a carbon price, you know, with a certificate, carbon certificates and so on. So they immediately started saying, well, I mean, we have these forests that store carbon, so we should be paid for that. Mm -hmm. And they made some, some of them made some very simple calculations. One hectare stores 8.8 .8 tons of carbon times 25 euro for the carbon price. So we should be getting 200 euros per hectare. Well, it's not as easy as that. 
And that's what <coughs> we are saying. We are seriously looking into this because, as I said earlier, we may get into a situation where people cannot live from the forest anymore. No. Uh, and they may not even be able to cover the management costs. But we want the forests, we need them, especially because they are a carbon sink and they're, they're supposed to remain a carbon sink. So we cannot afford to lose forests. Mm -hmm. and we have to make sure they remain. So we may have to think about ways of, of compensating the, the forest owners for all these services that the forests are providing. But how this can be done and which services exactly and how much and so on, that needs to be uh, looked at much more closely. Um, this is not something we will be able to decide in the next two months. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. So there's some momentum and also financial momentum, at least in German forest policy. Perhaps, Bernhard, I come to you. You're presenting private forest owners, not of Germany, but of Austria here. Today we visited a forest owner here nearby Bonn, and he was, we had a lot of discussions um, about this question of payment for environmental services. And, and he basically, to sum up his position, he made two points. First of all, for him, it's really important to be independent. He was mentioning agricultural subsidies as a problem on one hand. On the other hand, he was seeing that there's more and more societal demands towards this forest that are coming. So he sees the need for exactly what was mentioned here to, to get some incentives. And he showed openness and was very interested in, in engaging with these societal demands. But it somehow was, again, connected to financial questions. And I guess you were representing forest owners in Austria. How do the Austrian forest owners see the situation? You mentioned the, the vision of the bioeconomy to contribute to climate change mitigation of forestry in that regard. So how are Austrian forest owners shattered by climate change? How do they discuss about payments for environmental service, about investment from the public, and about societal demands? It's Thank you. You raised uh, already one of the answers. Uh, it's, it's maybe the same way the, the colleague here in, in Germany told you. Uh, it's a big issue to be independent as a forest owner, because we need this flexibility to manage our forests. Uh, but we uh, receive from the political decision makers are mainly or more questions than answers. Um, so uh, one of the, of the big issues is this conflict of targets and these conflicts of laws and conflicts of interests, uh, which we face on the, on the estate uh, as a forest owner. So to bring some examples, um, and there were some examples raised already. So uh, we, we are told, or we have to uh, adapt our forests uh, for, for climate change. Um, and so we need maybe new species or, um, yeah, uh, new trees. On the other hand, uh, we are not allowed to use uh, foreign trees because of risks and other uh, arguments. Um, the same ways, uh, and we, we had this issue already, uh, we are told to, to store CO2 in the forests, but we are also told to bring out biomass to substitute uh, fossil products and materials. So there's a conflict in between these two uh, ideas. And uh, to bring uh, maybe nature uh, um, protection aspect um, with the beaver. Uh, we are told to protect the beaver, which is fine and nice, and I agree. But in the same uh, way, uh, the beaver uh, damages our Natura 2000 areas, and we are told to protect these Nature 2000 areas. But we don't get uh, answers and solutions for that. And this is where we sit in this, yeah. Mm -hmm. In, in between as, as forest owners. Uh, therefore, maybe I, I could bring two elements what we miss. Uh, what we miss in the current uh, politician, politician making, uh, 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 yeah, is uh, one thing we miss is the interaction between the different uh, DGs. Because uh, they have to talk with each other and bring the solutions. It's not the forest that they should talk to each other and, and bring solutions. It's up to the decision makers. So, and that's what we miss. I know there are instruments for that, but uh, when, when, you, when, you, um, when you are following the processes, then you see that these uh, yeah, uh, things are not working. And the other thing we miss is uh, in most of the 
nature directives and also strategies, we miss this uh, dynamic approach. Because uh, the idea of uh, most of these uh, uh, measures is uh, to restore and preserve nature situation in a historic way. But climate change is fact. And this historic uh, situation on exact this area won't be there in future. Mm -hmm. So you can't restore this situation there and uh, you can't preserve it. But this is what these uh, nature uh, directives and also uh, we have the fear that also the biodiversity strategy will bring these elements. Uh, so they are really missing this dynamic aspect in context with the climate change. Thank you, Bernhard. Um, may I ask back? A bit more concretely, imagine Austrian government, now you have a conservative green government, they take, let's say, 400 million euro in their hands to help forest owners. Would you say, well, nice, but we don't need that, we would rather be a bit on our own and keep the flexibility? Or would they say, well, we give that to you, but it comes with some ideas what you do in forest management? in towards <coughs> conservation direction. So to feel a bit like that, what would, what would you answer to, to such an offer? <laughs> it's easy to answer. What, what we uh, make clear is that when we gain money, EU money or national money, uh, then we gain it only for uh, precise uh, deliverables. Yes. We don't gain money for owning forests. We bring deliverables. We bring ecosystem services. We uh, we are the one who implement all the strategies. So we are the one on the area who work with and in the forests. Yeah? So this is only, uh, it's not an income. It's only uh, a, a, a solving of the costs. So it's, that's what we see it. Thank you. Um, Luc, I have one question for you, and then I have one for Mats, and then we open up for all you many questions that you have in the room. And when I started my career in forest research many, many years ago, there was a very heated debate here in this country about close to nature forestry. What does it exactly mean? How can we define it or how can we not define it? And all the NGOs that had their own concepts on what does close to nature forestry mean? What does integrated forestry management mean? Now I have a bit the impression the conservation movement has a bit moved away from that. I hear a lot of debates about we need to protect old growth forests, we need to engage in rewilding, and also in, in your comments I, I heard that. At the same time, there's a lot of debate within the forestry world, it continues to be about close to nature forestry. So what is your position, Luke? Are you also engaged, in, because you said ISUN is also close to nature, close to people, to quote this gentleman there. Would you be in, close to Bo? Uh, would you be, you, mentioned, you said you are close to Bo. So would you engage in this discussion about close to nature forestry, or is it sort of a fruitful way for you to go? Or do you say, well, actually, our preference is, is something else? OK, that's a mouthful, eh? quite yeah. a question. Yeah, I always make many, um, many questions, and you can choose one to answer. No, I think, <laughs> I think it's, it's important. First of all, I, for those that don't know IOCN well enough, I think I have to say what it actually is. Yeah, we have the German government is a state member of IOCN and many others around the globe. We have users, the, the Private Forest Owners Association is a member of ICN, and we have the dark green, if you like to call them like that, conservation <laughs> NGOs, <laughs> which might okay. be pushing back on this inclusive or the, uh, the, the forest management in the, in the conservation context or to make sure that it happens in an integrated way. So there is not just one truth on this. Mm. That's the first. Mm. There is also not just one forest, but I don't have to tell you that. And there is different areas, and there are some areas that we have to protect very rigorously and very strictly. That's, let's park that, okay? That has to be done, and it's still not been done well enough. We just have to, res we have to recognize that. There are still areas that are under very high pressure, which shouldn't be under pressure. Let's park it, okay? That's, that's, one, that's one gone. I think the dialogue between the conservation organizations and the sectors is of incredible high importance. That means you have to approach each other, and when you approach each other in a dialogue, and when you have to do it, when you have to come out of your comfort zone, it's better to do it not in the public. That's one thing that is really important. <laughs> okay, so. so. <laughs> but this is not the public. These are all, we're all together here, right? It's not, it's not in the news yet. No, but it's yeah. very sensitive. So we have done roundtables with the Commission for Agriculture to bring the farmers and the environment NGOs together and 
come out of their trenches of their opinions on yeah. how they should be managing the land and how things can be taken forward. I think the same model of a platform, a safe platform, and at times a public platform between the conservation organizations and the forest, uh, or foresters or the forest institutes, especially the ministries also, because I think sometimes we even help the ministries to talk to each other within a country, because that's also a challenge. Um, <laughs> Um, so, okay, so, so that is very important, and I think so, you, uh, to answer your question, the, the short answer would have been no, eh? it's not, we definitely not given up. Mm. Some push a bit harder on that side or on this side. Um, and in that context, I do have to reply to that shift issue that uh, was mentioned before, the shift towards ecology, which is seen as a threat. I'm not going to repeat what Umberto said, but mm. honestly, it is finally, finally, it seems that Europe is waking up of what's actually needed to the benefit of all, but it has to be done in a very just way. So, and this is also a big part of the Green Deal. We just have to see how it's gonna be crystallizing, but it has to be a just transition. And the just transition is not only the coal workers or coal mine workers that will have to have a find a new job in the renewable energy. Mm. No, it's in other ways as well. So it will be different. So you'll have to accept that your f the forest sector will also be different. Is a transition going to happen? And it's better to prepare for it. That's a as a third point I wanted to make is there is a lot of distraction on the climate issue. I mean, it's enormously important, <laughs> but, and we have to prepare for it, and our forests have to be more resilient to cope with it, so to adapt to it. And there is a pressure for, for fossil fuel substitution and, and products and on, and on fuel that has to be managed. But there is still a lot of fundamental land use that's not going well in Europe. Still, that's still happening, and we have to, re we have to recognize that mostly in the context of agriculture, but also in the context of forest and forest management. So let's recognize these things. Let's also recognize the needs. Let's recognize the fact that a just transition will have to include compensation for forest owners in parts where forests are better not managed or better protected. Other parts, and this is the, the very itchy part for the conservation community, there might be parts where, the, where we have to say, okay, these parts are not as key for biodiversity as we may have thought they were, and we should accept a little bit more management there. Mm. So I think if there is a, a touching point that has to be found, and if we, if we don't do that, then I think we will just continue in the same way. And I think if the shift is to be, if that is to be the shift, I think it will be a great shift. And I'll finalize with the, with the following. It's a Green New Deal. Some people say new. It's actually a Green Deal because we didn't have a Green Deal anyway. Yeah. So it's yeah. not a new Green Deal. But, but it does remind me of um, what happened in the 30s with the crisis and Roosevelt. And I think maybe some, somebody has already made that comparison. Roosevelt, there was a big crisis, economic crisis, and he was very daring to put institutions in place. A lot of regulation, which the Americans hate, you know that. And he was called a communist by many, and, but he still did it. And he put the economy back on track. He was just courageous, it was leadership. I think if Timmermans, will be at some point called a green activist, I think we might have some hope of going in the right direction and not just for nature, but also for the foresters. Thank you, many food uh, for thought. Um, well, what we try to do with the European Network Integrate is a bit to offer this platform for a, right. for a dialogue. Um, would it be also nice to do this a bit more with you? Uh, you should come. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mats, you're chairing the, the network, and if I look at Denmark, there has been a huge transition. It was mentioned by Bo, the, the forest director, 30 years ago, what, what his opinion was on biodiversity. If I understood it correctly, with, with our collaboration with Denmark, now in the network Integrate, it's basically has shifted from sustainable wood production orientation in public forestry to what's close to nature forestry, multi-purpose forestry, and now in more and more also strictly protected areas. So what is a bit the lesson to be learned from this transition in Danish public forestry, also for this idea of direct talks, because you highlight a lot in your statements this idea of direct talks, talking with each other, building trust between people. So is, what is your lesson learned from this transition? And do you see it in an integrate network? I might say some of the same things that I did before, but first <laughs> of all, 30 years is a very short time within a forestry uh, uh, rotation, so to say. Um, that's the first thing to say. Within these 30 years, 
there had been so many different kind of, uh, um, of changes of political uh, direction on, uh, on public forest in Denmark. So uh, first of all, we need to build flexible forests so we can deal with uh, whatever comes up, I guess. Secondly, lessons to learn that, in my point of view at least, uh, we have been too slow on reacting to, to new ideas, new wishes to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to come out of uh, forestry in Denmark. Um, this, um, it has in some way, sometimes at least, been seen as a threat when someone wanted something else from a forest. Mm -hmm. It has, been, it has not been good because it has led to the fact that we have been struggling to keep up uh, with these uh, new ideas without, rather than taking them in, inviting people in, gaining trust about how to find the solutions together. This we must do better, I think. And this could be a lesson learned. Uh, don't see things as a threat. If there is a, bi and there is a biodiversity crisis, we need to solve it. And the forest, of course, has a, a, a role to play there. We have to find the, the, the balance between segregation and which of the, the tasks can be uh, uh, handled in, within the integration. So that's why we say, let's do both. And let's integrate some of the segregation that are needed. And this is exactly what we are uh, dealing with under the Danish chairmanship within the Integrated Network this year. Uh, and we have the, our next meeting in the, in, in the end of uh, April, where we'll show the, <laughs> the, the many participants, hopefully, uh, how we are trying to deal with this uh, solution in, in the Danish context at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Mats, and thanks for doing some advertisement again for the Integrated event. I would now really like to open up for the auditory. I'm sure there are many questions here already, first people showing up. We will try to collect three or four, and please make clear whom you address here in the panel. There's a gentleman over there. And please say your name when you put your question statement. And be short. <laughs> OK, I try to be short. <laughs> um, maybe it goes to uh, Eva Müller. Um, and you are? <laughs> ah, Benjamin Pusher. I'm working in the federal office for agriculture, but I'm private here, so it's not the official oh, okay. position yeah. of Chatham House. <laughs> um, yeah, my question is relating to ecosystem services and private forest owner. And if we look in the future, and now there will be a lot of compensation for the forest owners that they get the revenue that they lost. And I was thinking, if we if we think about the future and about a good solution. Is it really good to compensate the forest owner for all ecosystem services and they can make a lot of revenues over many, many years? They don't have any economic safeguards. And if they don't earn money anymore because of maybe bad decision or climate change, then we compensate them and we will continue to compensate them for the next years because it's difficult and they cannot provide the ecosystem services and we have to pay for it. Isn't it better or isn't, isn't it as a goal we could aim for to maybe reduce the amount of small private forest owner and to compensate them that they get their revenues, but to maybe try to get um, a state, I mean a, a higher proportion of public forests, and that we say, okay, this provision of ecosystem services is something like education, which should be free and which should be provided by the state. I mean, of course, it's very controversial to say we shouldn't have uh, private forest owners, but I just want to send this into your direction and maybe discuss about the issue. Thank you. We give Eva some time to prepare for the answer. I'm happy to hear that when you started saying we reduced the amount of private forest owners, but now I understood <laughs> that you meant it. Now I understood how you meant it. We take two more before we ask the panelists to respond. Or oh, no one wants to... Manfred Klein from BFN. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the colleague from the Wageningen University uh, had as a claim or consideration to give more competence to the EU level, to the uh, 
Does it fit to what is meant in other member states in Europe? Do you think that will be <laughs> successful? To whom are you addressing to this? To Umberto. To Umberto, okay. Okay, Umberto, difficult one for you. Um, Camilla. Hi, I'm Camilla Dolris from the European Forest Institute. It's also to you, Berto. And I was, <laughs> it's also about the common agricultural policy and how you see the new green or the green deal um, relating to the second pillar of the common agricultural policy that is already um, addressing the forestry measures. And if you see that there is opportunities there. Okay. Thank you. Um, perhaps we take one more, if there's one more. But not to Umberto, because he has already two. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Daniel, Daniel Rutte, um, one towards Eva Müller. And how will you avoid that there will be a payment per hectare compensation mechanism to forest owners, um, similar to agriculture, because that seems like an in a, a simple compromise that could be made, but very dangerous, from my, at least in my opinion. And you're representing i I'm, I'm just an interested citizen. Okay, interested <laughs> citizen. <laughs> okay, so perhaps we start with uh, Eva. You got two cool questions. One was on the compensation to forest owner, if there's a certain subsidy trap, if I understood it correctly. And if there's not a better way to, if I understood correctly, to transfer some of the small-scale forestry into public forestry. And secondly, there was this question about the per hectare payment subsidies. Okay, the first one was quite a revolutionary idea, um, <laughs> especially for a country that is a democracy. And, um, but indeed, we do have two million private forest owners. Uh, and the, the average forest owner owns something like two hectares. So uh, when you first said that the forest owners used to make a lot of money from the sale of timber, I think for most of our forest owners, we can't really say that. There are a few that have a lot of forests uh, that may have made more money, but the majority of the forest owners, I don't think have become rich on their two hectares. So uh, that to start with. Um, if you imagine um, disowning all these forest owners and making private forests, turning them into state forests, then um, the these would be public services that the forests provide. Uh, and the state foresters would have to take care of that. Public services are also not for free. We all pay taxes. So in the end, you know, there would be a payment again. It just would come from the state. So it doesn't really solve the issue of paying for the service that that forest provide. The, the other question was about how to avoid payments for hectare compensations. The, uh, the basic idea is not to pay for the fact that they own the forest. It would be for um, the management or the, the activities that have to be carried out to ensure the continuity of these services. Mm. So it's not, not a payment, a flat payment for mm. having two hectares of forest. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, then to Umberto, you were asked uh, how the member states perceive more competency for the EU. I have to say that that was, not, that was uh, something from the science community brought to you. And secondly, you were asked about the cap. What possibilities do you see there? I'll answer to both and then two comments to other issues that were said, <laughs> but I'll promise to be quick. The first one, well, recently uh, uh, in this forest conference, this issue of oh, the forests are not EU competence, it's national competence, someone said. And I think it was Director General for Climate Action, Mauro Petitian, he said, okay, we don't need to discuss that. Okay, that's fine. What he meant is, whatever you say, there's of course EU competence on forests also nowadays, because you just look, Nature directives, how much of Natura 2000 needs forests? It's a lot. Uh, land use, uh, land use change and forestry regulation and so forth. So we don't need to be here competing with the member states who has more competence or not. It will depend on what Europe needs and it will need a bit more, I, I agree, a bit more EU level coordination. 
on the cap versus the green deal. First, there's a lot of discussion. Is the cap proposal that came before a green deal, is it fit for purpose with the green deal? That debate is being held right now. If you want my personal answer, yes, provided the level of ambition that the Commission has submitted remains. And then we have quite some instruments with target setting elsewhere to steer the cap strategic plans towards where, where it should be. Now, if you ask me, is the ambition level being kept by the co-legislators? I don't think so at all. All the proposals by member states tend to dilute. In any case, there's less money for rural development nowadays, that's true. But there's still a lot of forestry that can be done there. But there's new avenues in Pillar 1, the so-called eco-schemes, which have the same approach as uh, rural development in the sense that it's voluntary for the, the landowner, but it's compulsory for the member states to establish these so-called eco schemes. It can be dark green, light green, it depends. It can certainly also address uh, forestry, agroforestry, and so forth. So I think the camp can deliver a lot. My quick comments are, first, I need to react on the nature directives and the beavers and so forth, because <laughs> one thing I can tell you is uh, protected areas are not a problem for climate change. On the contrary, they are needed for climate change in the sense that we, are, we have some natural ecosystems well managed, they're usually resilient. And actually, you know, nature needs some disturbance to keep healthy. And that's what the beavers bring in. The beavers bring some disturbance. They help, for instance, to retain floods. The wolves that now occupy a lot of, of my time, including in Germany, they are polemic. Well, they do have an ecological service to, to bring in. They do control some, some ungulates, for instance, that are expanding. So this is not an issue of either humans or the rest. We need humans, human management, and a lot of the human management can, can tap from uh, nature around. And there will be more protected areas in the future, I'll tell you, because that's what the world is needing uh, under the biodiversity. My final comment is a word of, uh, of caution on paying, paying ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. There was actually one expert on the topic once told an unrelated story that is enlightening, which is there was a school where many, many parents, I think this is a real, a real story, many parents arrived too late to pick the kids. So the, the school board established a penalty. They would pay if they arrived late. The result was that more parents uh, started coming late because now they have the right to pay. So it was not really a moral problem. So in that sense, if we start paying everything that nature gives, whenever there's no money flow, I can just destroy, can't I? And that's the word of caution. We should pay to a certain proportion uh, and to other proportion. Uh, landowners are also citizens, and they cherish the land, and some things just should be as they should. Okay, thank you. And I think Bernard will take from this this forward, owners will not receive penalties in the future if, they, if the alliteration was understood differently. Bernard, you want to respond shortly? And then I would like to go back to Oliver. No, no, just uh, one, one question was raised in the discussion. It, it's not clear for me who is paying. The discussion was all, always about is it official money or not, or, or, or state money. I think there should be a market for these ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. So this is what uh, forest owners would like to have. We want to mm -hmm. be on the market, and we don't want to have uh, like subsidies or only only money for something. So uh, let's establish markets for these ecosystem services, and it's not about uh, public money. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Quick on this, Luke. I think you make a good point This is related to the comments and this is this whole notion of cost versus investment. And when you work with nature and you do something in the nature context, it's still seen as a cost. And we have to start to making an investment case. And if we don't make the investment case, we have a big problem. And in that context, IOCN launched a coalition of private investment in conservation, always with the context of sustainable use attached to it, because there's always this combination. It's not never about strict conservation. And that coalition is now providing blueprints to see how you can actually make it an investment case. Mm -hmm. Now, in Europe, to let it work in Europe, and this is maybe hasn't been mentioned as, uh, enough, but it's, and in the forest sector is one of those, you, you will need to do a proper accounting for natural capital. Mm -hmm. We have systems in place, we cannot have it perfect. There was this discussion about how much should it be per hectare and what is the number. I think we should go for safe underestimates. I think the conservation community and maybe the forest community, we always want to be perfect before we then start formally to calculate. Let's, let's, let's take a safe uh, estimation and start from there. 
that is something I think we start to have to start doing. We cannot continue to have an academic discussion about ecosystem services mm -hmm. and natural capital. We have to start actually doing it with the safeguards to make not make mistakes. That's perfectly possible. So let's try to do that. And I want to say in that context to finish, um, and maybe I haven't said it yet, but I, I would love the forest community to be massively present in Marseille in June, from the 11th to the 19th of June. We have already a lot of practitioners that come, but maybe not enough from Europe yet, so note it. There will be very intense discussions on productive landscapes. We, in the new ICN program, we do not speak just about protecting, but we speak about productive landscape management as a pillar for, for the new IUCN program that will be voted by our NGO members and by our government members. So um, you can then use it <laughs> and call your government um, to, to, uh, to record. Thank you. So you have uh, your calendars are filling up with the events that you should go to. <laughs> and there's some need for you two gentlemen to talk, continue talking about private investment in forestry afterwards. Next round for questions, Thomas Hausmann from BML, Rick de Freese from EFI. Uh, let, let's go, uh, let's start with Thomas and then Rick and then the lady here. Who is first? <laughs> so if you saw it better, then start over there and then Thomas and then Rick and then two here in the front. Maybe it's because my name is not known yet. <laughs> um, I'm Andrea. I study at the University of Freiburg. Um, it's more of a reflective thought to the whole committee in front. I would like to move the discussion in Eastern Europe and developing countries um, where also big percentages of old growth forests lie. And we also deal a lot with um, unpredictable problems such as illegal logging. And I would just like to hear the opinion of, of the participants on this topic. Can you repeat it? I didn't get the last. So you want to hear I would just like to hear uh, the opinion of the participants on how successful this new strategy might be in Eastern Europe. So Eastern Europe focus. Thank you. Then uh, Thomas Hausmann is on my list. Yeah, thank you. I was already introduced. Um, I like very much the presentation of Bo Larsen and his uh, statement on the importance um, that the local level has to find the best balance uh, approach for an integrated forest management. I think that was a very important statement. And I do see a contradiction with a statement from Mr. Umberto Delgado um, that there should be more EU policy um, needed. So maybe we could get some, some uh, reply if this is a contradiction or not. And the second point to the private forest owner, and maybe Mr. Budil can also speak uh, not only for Austria but also for, uh, for other parts uh, of Europe. I see the great risk that, and this was mentioned several times, that there is no income in anymore. There are a lot of problems now with the damages and some of the forest laws force you to replant within a given time. So that might be the situation that forest owners just give up. And we have 80% in some European countries uh, forest owners. I see a great risk uh, for, for forest fires and a lot of other issues which should be solved maybe first. Do you have some um, information how the private forest um, uh, association could maybe prevent such a scenario? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Next on my list is uh, Victor Fraser over here. And then two more on the first row. And then we give uh, our panelists a chance to respond. Uh, thank you. I'm picking up a bit where Bo uh, ended his final slide. But um, on uh, we have to work with the people. And up to now, in the discussion, we have been discussing average Joe as uh, working with average Joe as a, a challenge. All these urban citizens, they have comments on how we do uh, forestry, but I think we should also uh, see it a bit, uh, as Bernard said, it's, it's a, not a, only a challenge, but it's an opportunity. Um, I would like to uh, compare it with, uh, with conservation. If you see the amount of money that uh, private conservation organizations are able to, to, to mobilize, to buy land, um, if you see how touched a lot of people are by trees, like uh, we have referred to Peter Wolleib and, and, and the forest balting movement and so on. There's a lot of funding available. People are, private people are willing to invest in, in forests, I think, uh, and invest in sustainable forest management. Um, we have the discussion, do 
PES have to come or payments for ecosystem services have they do they have to come from from the state um, but I think this is a bit an opportunity which is not not discussed enough at the moment thank you thank you that's more a statement perhaps <laughs> okay then two more here yeah. the lady over there uh, hello Barbara Pais from the Europark Federation um, it's for Eva. It's going back to your first intervention. I was really happy that you mentioned the recreational activities because in our field trip just a couple of hours ago, uh, the only private owner that was with us, he actually shared his thoughts and his um, angst uh, on um, the recreational activities. And I asked him straight away, okay, so what would you prefer? Would you prefer to have a compensation for the ecosystem services you deliver? And he said, oh, this will take so many years. If the German government could at least um, release me the recreational activities that I need to do. So what he needs to do is to clean up the tracks and to remove branches and to make a safe um, path for, for visitors and he gains, gains nothing on that. So my question is, uh, is the German government also thinking how to compensate for the recreational activities or how to remove the burden of uh, having the trails prepared? Um, because when you mentioned the recreational activities, then you looked at Umberto and said, okay, we need a more economic and social perspective on the EU Green Deal. Uh, but shouldn't this be at a national level? And for Umberto, it's just a comment. Very happy to hear about protected areas um, being recognized as important areas for the management of our forests. Um, and also very happy to hear that it's going to grow. Um, what are the targets and how do you think this will be possible? Okay, thank you. Then there was one more, would it, or? And then we have to close. Last round of answers and final statements. Yeah, Dennis Reutsch, um, I'm also with EFI, um, and we've heard a lot about the services that forests provide and uh, that perhaps foresters should be uh, compensated for the positive externalities that they uh, create by managing the forest. Uh, then I wonder a little bit perhaps, um, and we have not heard so much about that, uh, that there are also disservices uh, perhaps coming from forests. It's not a well-researched topic yet, um, but who would, um, yeah, who would be responsible for covering the costs there? And uh, just building a bridge to the farmers, perhaps that's more easily, uh, uh, or an easier example, because um, they get a lot uh, from, you know, planting crops and uh, they gain these benefits to production ecosystem services, but they also have a lot of negative impacts on the um, right regulate, uh, regulation services. And their society pays that, so that's what, um, yeah, how it came about, about, uh, sorry, yeah, I lost my thought here. But uh, maybe you can answer just, uh, or respond to the first aspect about the disservices, thank you. Thank you, Dennis, and it's getting late. We should come to a closing <laughs> round. Uh, I think first question was Eastern Europe. There was no one clearly addressed. Who wants to say quickly something on this? What's in there for Eastern Europe in the new EFU policy? Look. No, that's another question. Okay, <laughs> then answer to the question how you got it. So, <laughs> so I'll let uh, Umberto answer that one. Okay. Your <laughs> question. Yeah, sorry. There. No, I think <laughs> it was just about, and I think it's a, it's a really important point made because I think our focus was indeed on the context that we know best or especially also in the panel here. I don't know what, how your debates were in the last day or last two days, how much you've been addressing outside of the EU uh, and even further in the develop, into the developing uh, world. Um, and we cannot, of course, discuss forests without talking about what's happening outside and what a huge responsibility we have in the EU and how we actually shift a lot of that responsibility on, on pressure on land even into the developing countries. It's the same with climate change. We are very proud about our, what is it now, 25% reduction since 1990 that we have achieved in the EU, and that is something to be proud of, but it's not the full story. I mean, our consumption model has still not changed. And that those emissions are being pushed back into those countries, and it's the same with land use. So it is of uttermost importance that we take that into account. Now. The other element to this is the is illegal timber that still comes into the EU, which is not fair for the for the forest owners as well, I think. But it's also something that we tend to forget that most. And I was told I don't I don't I didn't do the, the the counting myself, but most of the illegal logging, or even more than all the tropical timber that comes into the EU, into the EU, comes from the Ukraine apparently. 
That is something I learned recently, and we're just looking the other way. I don't know why, but maybe for political reasons, because Ukraine has, has of course, other challenges to tackle in the east of its country. But in the west of its country, it seems like all this illegal timber is flooding into, into the EU. And that is something, of course, that you, you, you as a forest community, of course, have to, have to look at it at very carefully. And then if you look up on East EU, I think that is the context of compensation among the member states. And when you are there in, for example, let's take the World Heritage part of the Beach Forest Network, which you all know, in Romania. It's the biggest part of the whole network. But it's also very much under pressure, and we see that in the, in the buffer zones, up to t 10 meters from the actual World Heritage site, logging is going on, and it's even legally allowed in Romania. But th the point is that, and I'm taking the, is someone from Romania here, by the way? <laughs> That's not a coincidence. So, but I mean, Rom Silvan, as a public state, a public forest, um, um, state forest owners, they have to get revenue to manage their park, their national parks, and it has to come from timber. So there is this enormous, crazy situations that are still happening, and that I think has a lot to do with how Western Europe still can compensate more for the needs in Eastern Europe, because those forests in Romania and in other countries are of world importance and of European importance, and we have to, it simply means the West of Europe needs to pay for it. Thank you. Any additional aspect on Eastern Europe? I can join it on my reaction on protected areas, so I'll... Okay, so you go ahead already debate. off the list, great. So Should I? Yeah. But uh, let me try first to go to the alleged contradiction, local level, EU level. I don't see contradiction whatsoever. Actually, Bo also referred to both things. We, of course, I don't uh, expect that EU level will once come and to say to a local plot of forest what should be done there, of course. But there's some level of coordination of where forest policy should be, go towards if we are to take into account, for instance, climate issues, um, bioeconomy issues, uh, biodiversity issues, there's a level of coordination that we benefit to have and that we have in practice already, that's what I meant, not at all to overcome the local level. Um, now, there was a reference to private conservation, this sense of an opportunity. I'll just say the following. I don't know the German situation, Eva will comment. But in my own country, I'm from Portugal, around but plus than 90% of the forest is private. And I'll tell you, I'll, a big part of it, if someone that doesn't even care where is my, my lot, my little lot that I've inherited, I certainly don't want to spend money there, and it's used to burn now every 10 years it burns. So this is a big opportunity to do what they do in the US, which is this land conservation easements, where there is a trust fund that comes and say, you keep the ownership, we manage for you, no costs for you. And then you get a big opportunity if pu public money comes in. Now, this issue of protected, protected areas, I'll tell you, we, we are in a year where a new global agreement for biodiversity is to be done in China, if the coronavirus allows, by October. Um, one thing we know will be on the agenda is increased protection. And that's because there are some estimates that say we should set aside 50% of the world, some say. Even 70%, some say, if we are to be sustainable. I actually don't think we need those levels. But we do need not set aside, but protection to higher levels. What we have at the table right now is a so-called zero draft proposed by a group of co-chairs. It calls of 30% protected areas. And at least within that, one third as strict protection. I don't think it's a scandal to imagine that we leave 10% of the world for, the, for, for essentially for nature, pro, natural process to begin with. But in Europe, what a protected area means is usually an, an area where people live and make a living and some economic activities are not only compatible, some are even required to keep the kind of nature we have in it. Uh, uh, we have. So we have this specificity that we'll have to take into account. The final key word, another comment just on a key word which will certainly be fundamental for a whole new global um, agreement and also for the EU biodiversity strategy is the key word that Luke used, which is a restoration. We cannot build a political agenda on doom saying. You need hope. You need to know where you can go if you're active. That's the restoration bit. We can put it back nature, and often with uh, quite some good returns on jobs and the economic balance. I promise to refer to Eastern Europe just to say, indeed we have 
uh, only remnants of what we can call primary or old growth forests in Europe. And those are extremely important, not because only of their natural values, but politically important. Because we cannot preach really to Malaysia or to Brazil or the Indonesia, you protect your forests, please, while we will st keep consuming and through our consumption, 10% of the global deforestation is EU consumption if we don't give the example. So that's where we have most of these treasures, that's Eastern Europe, in the Carpathians, notably Romania, and as you said, some logging legal according to Romanian law. There's a lot of illegal logging, be it for Romanian law or EU law, which just opened an infringement. And there are mafias operating, killing the forest guards. So, and this happens in Europe, not to mention Ukraine, which I imagine the far west, right next, close to the border, that was also described to me. So there's a lot of importance of keeping this old growth forests indeed. Okay, compared to these issues, your question is rather an easy one, Eva. Um, coming out of our field trip, there was this discussion about public access to private forest land and a claim made by a private forest owner to say it would be great if I would get release on these recreation issues by public support, right? This was what you brought up. So what's the German government's position on, on, on this? Well, uh, this is actually a very good example uh, because uh, the private forest owners provide a service to society by um, having this access to their forests and also taking care that the roads are maintained and so on and so forth. But that has a cost to them. But the benefit is not primarily to them. The benefit is to those who actually go walking the forest. Uh, and, and this is the type of activity that could be compensated by you know, some sort of um, um, payment for environmental services scheme. Not only that, or it could be that, or it could be part of a package that mm -hmm. includes other mm -hmm. services that, that the forest provide. But as I said, we are very early in this discussion, mm -hmm. uh, and we do not have any solutions yet. Uh, this is gonna take some time because as you can see, it's quite complex. Uh, mm. The decision to take, what are you compensating for? Which services? All services or only the, the recreation, for example, or the, the carbon storage? Um, there's all sorts of possibilities. And how do you do that? Who pays for it and so on? Many questions, and we do not have the solutions yet. The other question was something I didn't quite understand. What did you mean with the disservices of forests? Well, um, for example, when I think uh, you have shading, for example, especially if uh, students have some huge problems, things like that, um, and if they have some uh, probably other many examples like um, autistic experience, which are not being checked out. So there is like certain disservices. That makes the whole thing even more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so we let the Eichen Prozession spinner go its way now, and you discuss this afterwards. Uh, Bernhard, there was still a question from Thomas, I think, over there. Yes. If you, if you share, the, if you share the, the concern that there's a, um, a threat now that many private forest owners might disengage in forestry, and how do you think about this? Is there what's so because of economic problems, because of big calamities, disturbances? So is there sort of that was I think the statement as far as I can still recall it at that time of the day? Yes. So do you see this do you, do you see this threat and what's your response to that so from a there is a threat about that, but I come to that at the end of my statement. Uh, okay. first, uh, when when you asked me to to give an overview about the European uh, situation that's that's quite tricky because uh, there were already some answers and you see that uh, we are in a very inhomogen structure in Europe and that uh, starting with the ownership and with the political situation and so on so that's not easy to answer about that but um, 
I would like to have a comment on the on this what was it the uh, on this of this idea of this colleague up there uh, to to move private ownership into state forests. Uh, my question is: Has anyone in this room an example where pri where state forests have let's say a better outcome or a better working than private owner? Uh, or the majority of private owner in this uh, area. So I don't have this example. Um, so I'm not quite sure if this is the solution. Um, my answer for the, for the colleague from Romania could be, uh, yes, private ownership uh, and the, the politi a good political agenda could one be, be one of the solutions. Uh, I want to close with uh, one thing I skipped in my introduction. And this, uh, I, I published an article last summer, and I think it's still well. Uh, I uh, mentioned, or I, I pointed out the three main challenges we are facing right now and even in the future. And the one is, of course, climate change, not surprising. The other one is the political framework which we are in. And this comes automatically to the question of uh, property and 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 uh, and the laws around this and these conflicts between uh, legal topics and so on, which I mentioned already before. So the political framework is the second challenge, and the third one we, yeah, uh, we had in maybe all statements, but we didn't mention it in the right way. Is urbanization. Mm -hmm. So the third big challenge is urbanization. The people don't know in the cities what we are challenging outside in the, uh, in the countryside and what it means to manage forests and that this is work, daily work, and that it needs human resources to manage. And when I talk about manage, it's not only harvesting. Managing is also managing uh, set-aside forests or managing uh, natural protection areas. Yeah? You need people out there on the area and the, these people, they need uh, uh, a revenue. So this is what we are talking about. Um, so uh, urbanization and communication is the answer about this. We need good communication about uh, all of this so that uh, all these people in the cities uh, understand what, what, what it is about. Mm. Um, so the last, the last question from you was about, uh, is there a threat about that people will give up the, the forest ownership? Yes, it is. Uh, I can talk about middle Europe, and uh, when I reflect the last two years, and uh, I look a bit in the future, and we have uh, amazing thrusts, uh, thrusts uh, right now in, in Austria, and also I think in, 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 in the south of Germany, uh, no rain, no uh, snow, and uh, already temperatures which we hadn't for decades uh, in February. So uh, the situation will get worse. Mm. And we face already many small scaled forest owners, but also big scaled forest owner, which are close to uh, give up their forests. And I have no answer right now what then will happen. But the thing I mentioned before, that we need people out in the area to manage these forests, this uh, will need an answer. Okay, thank you. We are already behind the schedule, and I think we should close soon. I would like to give you, and it didn't really work with the minutes, so let's do it with a sentence. Could each of you think about um, the next forest policy meeting you are attaining? So is there any lessons learned from this discussion that you would bring in the meeting? And please, only one sentence, and I give you 30 seconds to relax and think about it. And then we start with the very end with Mats. Oh, you're quick. Uh, are you ready for your sentence? <laughs> what have you learned? The next meeting will be the integrate <laughs> meeting that we are, <laughs> that we are uh, uh, chair of uh, ourselves, of course. And, um, these, these talks about the flexible uh, flexibility within the, the forest that we uh, that we need to uh, to uh, obtain, that will be uh, one thing I'll I'll bring uh, with me. Thank you, Mats. So the next meeting from me is a meeting where I won't participate, but where I will write the background questions. And uh, my my output from today is uh, communication is all about. So talk about these things, and, and for those who are doing the decisions, uh, please be open-minded and uh, take this holistic approach we need. Thank you. Eva Müller. 
I have so many meetings. <laughs> They're not all related to forests either, so um, I won't refer to a specific meeting, but um, the issues around ecosystem services are complex. That's what I knew, but now after hearing all of this for two days, I think they're even more complex than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a My message if you meet with 100-something scientists and Umberto. My point would be around the word uh, integration, I would also consider, let's say, the integration of mindsets, in the sense that I think a lot of the divides we face on forest debates come from different worldviews, different points of departure of where we stand, what we cherish, what we value, what is the right balance. So I think that a meeting discussing this these views that nature knows best and we should be hands off, or nature is a chaos and it needs to be managed. Approaching these positions in a continuum would benefit a lot for the future, I think. Thank you. If Look. Umberto wouldn't have said it, I would have said the same, because you need this dialogue, you need it in a safe place. But my next meeting on forest, if I'm not mistaken, will be with the CEPF and Eustafor in Brussels in March. So to continue the dialogue, to continue the exchange and to see how we can bring all these, uh, these sites and these expectations also of forests together. Awesome. So, something learned and many meetings ahead. And yes. You have also a meeting, Bo. No, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but. I have, the, I have the feeling that you are going to close up now. And uh, <laughs> yes. bef of before that, before that, having served EFI as a Chairman of the board for five years, I want to thank uh, EFI, I want to thank you and the whole crew here for organizing this meeting. It has been extremely helpful. It has been extremely important for the development which we are going to do for the next years or two. Um, so um, we have talked a lot during my time at in the board about how where should uh, EFI be positioned? And we started to talk about uh, policy advice. And I was vehemently working on saying, no, we are not making advice, we are making policy support. Uh, we have to deliver, you have to deliver support for policy making. And that's exactly what you're doing here now. And I'm so proud of you, and I'm so proud of, of, of the whole crew here, and I want to convey that before you are closing up with your dull um, uh, things. Okay? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, if there are more statements like that, we can continue. <laughs> But I think some people might be tired. I would really, really like to thank you, panelists, for coming partly a far away from Berlin, Brussels, from Austria, from Denmark, in a very busy time in forest policy, environmental policy. You did a great job. I think it was very, very interesting for all here in the room. And I want to thank all in the room for having been here, for asking perhaps not as many questions as we thought, because we had a lot to discuss. It was great that you were here. Um, I have some presents. I have so many presents that I really don't know who gets what presents. But I would assume that these are the presents for you, and I lost my connection, so I can only take one present now. <laughs> this is for you. Thank you, look. And we have some more. And please, an applause. <laughs> and okay. So, thank you very much. Um, we will continue tomorrow morning with...